Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is my first time in Russia. I re it, it's cold. I'm in, from Florida, but I like it. It's nice. It's uh, very impressed. So th uh, this afternoon, I wanted to talk to you about um, one of my favorite topics is Akka. I'm a, I'm a developer advocate at Lightbend. And Lightbend is a company that um, is, uh, you may know of us, in, in a couple years ago, we renamed ourselves. We used to be called TypeSafe. And now we're, we're called Lightbend. We, we uh, changed the name. Uh, we're the company behind the Scala language. One of the co-founders of the company, Martin Ordesky, is the creator of Scala. And the other co-founder of the company is Jonas Bonner, who created Akka. So um, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, an implementation of, of event sourcing in CQRS using Akka and running on a cluster, so an Akka cluster. So that's what we'll be, we'll be covering here. So the, um, how many of you have heard about event sourcing in CQRS, just out of curiosity? Okay. It, what it is, is um, CQRS is command query responsibility segregation. So there's this concept of commands or requests to come in and to, to do something, to perform some action. And of course, queries are just to retrieve information. But there's this sp splitting that occurs. And that's what I want to show you in this diagram. So in this diagram, what uh, I got this, it, it's kind of a, uh, inspired by some, a diagram that I saw in some Microsoft documentation. If you're, if you're curious about event sourcing and CQRS after this talk, an excellent source of documentation for this is Microsoft. They have a lot of documentation on this. So anyways, in this diagram, what I'm showing is the way this works. And the big change here is how we persist data. So traditionally, normally we persist data, we, you know, I think probably all of you that have done any software development, you know, you've done something where you, you've uh, created data in a relational database, and you've got tables, and you're, you know, we're, we're um, performing transactions and updating those tables, or inserting or deleting, or whatever, you know, doing the create, read, update, delete, CRUD types of operations. With this, what we're doing is commands come in to the system, and a command is a request to do something. It's a future tense, something to do just in the future. The commands come into, say, a service. The service validates that command, that t command typically. You know, is this a legitimate com command to be performed? And if it is legitimate, then what happens is we're persisting events. So some of the examples I'll be showing you is a simple, say, uh, bank account. So with a bank account, the two most common commands are deposits and withdrawals. So with deposits and withdrawals, you're updating the state of the bank account. You know, we're either adding to the account with a deposit or we're, or we're, we're decrementing the, the account with a withdrawal. So the idea here is that the persistence actually happens in two separate databases. There's a write side and a read side. The write side is where we're actually capturing the events. And the reason for this is that we're, we're keeping history of every single change that occurred to each entity. So instead of doing, say, updates and deletes and inserts, we're actually, actually capturing the history of every deposit, every withdrawal. You know, say if, if we're doing an order, it would be we, we capture add item, remove item, change the item quantity, add shipping address, add billing address. All of those are events that uh, aggregate into it the state of an entity. So this event store is also called an event log, and this is where we're capturing the events. And then when events are being uh, captured on the right side, which is a really simple data store, it's like a key value pair. You know, it's like the entity ID and a timestamp, or the entity ID and a, and a sequence number. So it's very, very fast. So part of the reason for doing event sourcing in CQRS is to build services that can scale to very high levels, to very high volumes, because you can capture these events very, very quickly and store it in a relatively simple data structure. But then there's a the read side, and the read side, it, what you're doing there is you're capturing the data in a way that's optimal for querying. So in, you know, in this case, <clears throat> we're identifying, say, the queries that this service would do. So think, think of this as a microservice, for example. And this microservice has a well-defined set of queries that it performs. So the data is being stored typically in a denormalized fashion so that it's optimized for queries. So part of what this is addressing, there's a lot of motivation for doing this kind of uh, persistence. 
One of the motivations, though, is the performance trade-offs that we've had to make typically, say, with a relational database. You know, with a relational database, we're always kind of optimizing for writes and for reads, and it's a trade-off. You add indexes to improve the, the read performance, but that comes at a price where it impacts the write performance. So, you know, how many indexes do you add before you start slowing things down too much? Here, what, what it is, is we're just kind of splitting it. So you split it up, and this is the responsibility segregation you know, of the CQRS, where we're splitting it, and we have uh, the event store for just capturing the raw events, and then we have the, the, the right side for capturing the, uh, the, the data in a queryable form. And there's kind of a publish-subscribe relationship. This is the, you know, the, the, right, the, the read side is eventually uh, consistent with the write side. So there's, there's not a single transaction that updates both of these. There's a transaction that updates the, you know, that's creating, uh, storing the events. And there's other transactions that are capturing the, the new data coming in you know, as, the, as the subscriber is consuming the events on the, the read side. So I've had a lot of discussions with people about this. This is um, uh, very controversial sometimes. Some people, it's kind of a love-hate thing. Some people love this kind of an approach and some people hate this kind of an approach. Uh, here I just wanted to show you what it looks like and so you can decide, do you love this or you hate it? I kind of like it because um, it, I've dealt with situations in the past where we've had databases that just we pushed it too hard and we couldn't push the database any faster. We, you know, we were constantly trying to tune it for reads and writes, and, but the end result was we could get a spike in traffic and the database just couldn't take anymore. And you know, we, we had situations where you know, the app would slow down, which isn't great. Here, it, it looks like the, the potential is, and this is why people are using it, is that you can scale to a much higher level. You can you know, build services that have a greater capacity to handle those spikes. And um, also, again, it's, it's dealing with the trade-offs between uh, a single database handling both reads and writes. We're, we're kind of splitting it apart. There's other advantages for the, the, the event log. Uh, one of the things is that we have all the history. We're moving into this era of data is the new oil, right? Data is very, very valuable. And you, everybody's wanting to do some form of analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And one of the things I've been saying for a while is that, you know, with CRUD, which is kind of the way we, we, we've been doing things for a long time, every time you do an update or delete, you make a data scientist cry because you're throwing away data. And data scientists like data. They want data. They, they like history. They, they want to analyze their data. So here's a, here's a, a, a simple example of the event store. Just, and I'm just showing, say, one entity where... Um, what we're storing, we're, we're storing, say, the, uh, the, the, the entity ID, the amount, and then the type of uh, event, you know, a, de a deposit event, a withdrawal event, another deposit event, and then the aggregate, which is derived from the entities, is the, the current balance. So uh, one question you may have, though, is that, like, with a bank account, you can have a very, very long history, and when you're recovering the state of a bank account, you don't want to have to necessarily run through all the history, like all the history for the last few years of this bank account. So there's this concept of what's called snapshotting. And what snapshotting is, is you periodically save the state of the entity so that when you're recovering the state of, of the entity, you, you recover from this, the last snapshot and any events that occurred afterwards. So it's a form of optimization that's relatively easy to implement. So clustered event sourcing in CQRS, this is where we get into a little bit of ACA. So how many of you have heard, heard of ACA or the actor system? Oh, excellent, okay. Um, with ACA, the, ACA is the actor system on the JVM, and there's APIs in Java, and there's APIs in Scala. You know, Lightbend is known as the Scala company, but we have APIs, and I'm a, I'm a Java guy. So I work for Lightbend, but I'm a Java guy. So I like showing Java developers all this cool stuff that, uh, especially Yaka, that Lightbend does. So the idea is that there's actors. And an actor is a, actually a relatively simple thing. An actor is, you know, it's just a class. You implement it just like you implement any other class. But the difference is that no other code directly invokes the methods of an actor. The only way that you can communicate with an actor is you send it an asynchronous message. So 
that's the change, is that you only, send, you only invoke actors using asynchronous messages. And there's tons of things that you can do with that. Things like, it's an excellent alternative to threading because you have this uh, model, uh, the actor model for doing highly concurrent operations with very simple code without a lot of complexity, you know, like writing thread-based code. Um, there's many other things you can do, and I'll, uh, hopefully I'll show you a few examples here. But the idea is Akka also runs naturally in a cluster. You can run Akka in a, on a single node and a single JVM, but if you want to, you can run Akka where the actor system is not constrained to a single JVM, but it can run in multiple JVMs, running on multiple machines distributed across the network. So that's what I'm showing here is like an example of four nodes, a cluster of four nodes, and these little boxes that I'm showing here represent entity actors. So these are actors that are created when there are commands or query requests coming into a specific entity. So this is what I'll be showing you is that how this works in Akka with Java. So the idea is that as commands come in, more actors are created. For the, so there's an actor for each individual entity. And Akka really is built to scale to like millions of actors, millions of actors per JVM. So when you're running in a cluster, you, you, you can scale to very, very high levels. So actors are really lightweight. They have a very small memory footprint. And they, they're, 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 Akka is built to, to handle millions of actors and millions of messages per second, things like that. So this can scale to very, very high levels. But also what happens though is that when entities have been, actors have been created and are not receiving any messages anymore, it's very easy to set up so those actors just shut themselves down. So the idea is that say um, a customer comes into your, your app and they start interacting with their, their bank account. You know, they're sending some mess, you know, they're doing some things that ultimately uh, result in messages getting sent to your bank account. An entity actor for that bank account is created. It's, it hand, <clears throat> handles the commands coming in, the query commands, the, you know, the deposits, withdrawals. And then if the customer is done and goes away, shortly after that, that actor will shut itself down because it basically gets bored. It's not receiving any messages and it just shuts itself down to, you know, to reduce uh, the resource consumption. The real payoff though is things like this, that you have a, you know, a, like a service that can be built to, sca uh, to uh, scale across a cluster and it can handle things like a hit where it loses a node. So the service itself just keeps running because the cluster is still up, but we've lost a node. So in this case, I'm showing like the third node goes down and what happens is that the way Akka, uh, the Akka, what's called Akka persistence, which is the uh, handling the event sourcing, uh, what it does is it just adjusts the sharding to uh, move these act the actors that used to shard to node three, it, they get sharded to other nodes. So it's, we don't have to write the code for that. It's all built, kind of built into Akka to do it. Uh, it's really fa fairly straightforward. But the point I want to make here is that you can scale up the cluster to handle more capacity when you need it and you can scale it back but you can also um, have situations where you just you know things break say in, uh, this could be running in a docker container the the host system that the docker container is running in say that failed or the network broke to that that uh, host system and that container goes down you know so we can just keep running and and there's no nothing really spectacular in the code to deal with this so just real quickly, with, uh, with microservices, a lot of interesting things are happening. And people are talking about, yeah, I'm implementing microservices, and there's really kind of a range of uh, styles that people are implementing microservices. None of them are wrong, including you know, still building monoliths. There's nothing wrong with continuing to build monoliths. But um, I kind of have it in five stages here, like from monoliths to what I'm calling a microlith. And a microlith is kind of a distributed monolith where you've broken up the code, but you haven't broken up the database. That's in the second column here, the, you know, the microlith. Um, again, nothing wrong with this. This is very common because a lot of times it's easier to break up your code, but then you start talking about breaking up a database, and sometimes that's not easy. You know, it's, it's, uh, it depends on where you work, but sometimes it's, it's hard to get people convinced to go with this, this nutty new way of doing persistence with uh, event sourcing and CQRS. Uh, but then some microservices are built where now you've, um, 
have split out tables and the tables are owned by the microservices, you know, the, idea, the idea is that you want to have as loose coupling as possible with your microservices and coupling is from an implementation as well as to a use. So uh, the difference is that with the micro list, you know, like say I'm on one microservice team and you're on another microservice team and I want to change a table, maybe you're using that table as well. I got to talk to you, right? We have to negotiate about what kind of change I can make. If my microservice owns its own schema, then I have a little bit more uh, freedom um, you know, to change it, or, and you have a little bit more freedom to change it. But then, keep continuing on the last two columns here, there's microservices that have gone the next step from, say, using a single database to event sourcing and CQRS. And one of the advantages in the last column I wanted to show is that you could store the data for querying in data stores that make sense. So for example, say some of your queries are best to be done against a relational database, but other queries would be de best to be done with some, you know, like inverted index database, like Elasticsearch. Now that becomes possible because you, can, you have this uh, approach for taking events from the event store and publishing them to whatever persistent stores you want to use, and you're not, limited to a single database technology anymore. You can, you can kind of you know, use what makes the most sense. So what I've got, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of the first three projects, but what I've set up is five sample projects. They're in GitHub. I'll show the URLs at the end of the talk. And we're going to walk through some of the features of these projects. But it's kind of building up to the, the last two projects that are, um, what happened? There it goes. The last two projects that are the, the most interesting here, the, the, the top two, where um, one project is set up to do, handle the, uh, the event store, and the, the, and the last project is set up to handle pulling the events, you know, the, 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 uh, being the subscriber to the events. So the first project just shows um, an actor that knows how to talk to actors across the cluster. I just want to show you a little sample of that. The second project uh, talks about the concept of a cluster singleton. This is an, uh, the situation where we want to have one actor across the cluster. So this, this is a little tricky to do. So this is part of ACA, it's already set up, but there's, this is something that we use in the, the final two projects, this, this singleton actor. And then the third project is where they call it uh, cluster sharding. ACA cluster sharding. And cluster sharding is the foundation for doing uh, clustered persistence across you know, ACA, what's called ACA persistence, which is the, the, front, the fourth project. So with the distributed actor, the, the first project, what I, what, it's real simple, but it's like, it's, it's like a single actor. There's an instance of this actor that's created on each node in the cluster. And all this actor is doing is sending messages to its counterparts across the cluster. So like in this first example, the actor on the first node knows how to send messages to, the, to its counterpart actors on the other nodes in the cluster. Just another example, say the, 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 act, the actor on the third node knows how to send messages to the other one. So I want to flip to uh, the project that does this real quick. So there's this class that I've set up. This, this is an actor in Java. So it's really simple, you know, it's just, just a class. The only thing that's different here is that we're extending a, uh, an ACA base class. And, th and there's one method that you need to implement, which is this create receive method. So what this create receive method is doing is it's defining the messages that this actor is set up to receive. So this one's real simple. It's receiving uh, three messages. There's a tick message. There's a ping and a pong message. So it's kind of a ping pong type of thing that I'm showing here. Um, so, so what I'm defining here in, these, um, in, the, in the, this matcher is that when I see a tick meth message, I'm gonna invoke this tick method. When I see a ping method, I'm invoking this ping method. Now the tick, I wanna show you, it's a little interesting. What, what's happening is that there's another method that I can optionally re override called pre-start. So this method is invoked when an actor instance is created, and it's, this method's called just before the actor is ready to start receiving messages. So what I'm doing here is I'm using ACA to set up a scheduler. So the scheduler 
it, it's the commonly used mechanism in ACA where I can, in this case what I'm doing is I'm scheduling this actor to receive the tick message on some interval. And this is just kind of, kind of simulate, act, uh, simulate activity. So the interval is, in this case, I just set it up as 10 seconds. Okay? So every 10 seconds, this actor is going to receive a, a tick me um, message. And it when it receives a tick message, it's going to just call this tick method. And what this method does is it, it invokes um, the uh, ACA cluster, and it asks for an iterator over the members in the cluster. So, you know, say, um, say you set up a cluster with four members, so there's gonna, this is going to iterate over each four of the members. You know, whatever, whatever the current state of the cluster is, this is what this, this uh, get members method returns. So all I'm doing here is that um, I want to send messages to everybody but myself, right? So, I wanna, so I'm just kind of doing a quick filter. So down in this tick member, what here I'm doing is I'm building a, what's called an actor selection. And an act, there's two, two ways to, to interact uh, or send messages to an actor. It's either through an actor's selection or an actor reference. Both of them, you could think of them as like um, uh, hyperlinks. Because, you know, see, I, I'm building it here, and, and really it's just a string where it's, it's got the, the, the address of the member and the path to the actor and the member. So it's very much like a URL, right? So then I create an actor selection from it, and then this is the code on line uh, 44 here that this is how you send a message from one actor to another. It's called the tell, right? So actor selection tell, and I'm just sending a ping message. That's it. So... It's just flinging off ping messages to the other actors in the cluster. All right? The handling of the serialization and transporting the message over the network to the other members in the cluster, which could be running on other nodes, is being handled by ACA. I'm not having to do anything special here. It's just uh, sending a, a message. Now, the, uh, the idea is that when the, the ping mes message comes in, it's coming into an instance of this actor. So when a ping message comes in, it invokes the ping method. The ping method down here on line 47 just gets the message. I log it out just for, for fun, just to show that this is happening. And then I respond with a, a, a tell to the sender. So I have, there's a call that you can invoke get sender, which gives me back the actor reference of the sender, whoever that is. I don't know, you know this actor doesn't need to know who, that act, who sent it. And then it just sends back a Pong. So when a Pong message comes in, I invoke, you know, this, this actor invokes the Pong method and um, it just logs it out, right? So I'm not gonna run this for it because I don't have enough time to cover everything I wanna cover, but the, the first project, you can grab the Git project, download it, open up like three or four command windows, start them up and, and watch and run this and then look at the logs and you can see how it, the, all these actors are talking to each other across the cluster. So let me go back. So cluster singleton. With the cluster singleton, the idea is that we're kind of building on what we just saw in the last project. But the, now what we want to do is we want to have one instance of an actor all running in the cluster. And this, this could be done for things like uh, this actor is, you know, it's kind of a, a single point of uh, decision making. You know, like uh, in, in the case of uh, ACA persistence, it's being used to decide where shards are actually located in the cluster. So that it's, it's kind of, we only want one of them. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the cluster singleton, but there are situations where it's, it's useful to have. But so the idea is that actors that want to send messages to the cluster singleton don't need to know anything about where the cluster singleton is in the cluster. Because the way ACA, uh, ACA works is that when you set this up, there's a uh, proxy actor on each node in the cluster. So the, the, the actor that wants to send a message to the cluster singleton just sends a message to the proxy, and then the proxy takes care of routing or forwarding the message off to the uh, cluster singleton. So the, the advantage here is that, say, the node that the cluster singleton was on goes away. So the cluster singleton is automatically moved, not in my code, not in your code, ACA's taking care of this for us 
to some other node in the cluster, right? So we have to deal with that. We just have to deal with, I want to talk, to, I want to send messages to the cluster singleton. D you know, don't make my life difficult. So that's the idea here. So let me show you this project real quick. Here's the cluster singleton project. The, um, here's the, uh, let me show you this one first. The, the cluster singleton aware actor, as I call it. The, this is just another actor. One difference is though, this actor, when it's created, it's being passed the actor reference to the proxy, right? Because we need that. We, that's where we want to send our messages to. So I'm using the tick again, you know, the scheduler, just for testing, you know, just to simulate uh, activity. And whenever a tick comes in, we, um, it, it's sending a message to the uh, cluster singleton proxy, and it's just doing a tell to the proxy. The proxy will then forward that message off to the cluster singleton wherever it is in the cluster. So this code is really simple. It's really easy to communicate with the cluster singleton. Even though this, say, this actor is on one node and the cluster singleton's on another node, this actor doesn't know anything about that. It just sends a message to the proxy and the proxy takes care of the rest. The cluster singleton actor itself is even simpler. This guy gets moved around by Akka there's only one instance of this actor somewhere in the cluster that's being managed by Akka, but we just focus on uh, you know, what this cluster single is supposed to do. Now, this one's real simple. All it's set up to do is receive ping messages and pong back to the sender. So a ping message comes in, it goes to ping, and it just do, does a get sender, does a tell back to the sender, and it's sending back a pong. So uh, notice also that this message isn't a string anymore, it's an object. An object you know, so a message can be any kind of an object. You know, and the only requirement is that object has to be serializable. Other than that, that, that's it. So real quick, now I want to move on to uh, sharding. So with cluster sharding, things get more interesting. And now we're getting closer to what we really want to do here with the, with the entity actors. So the idea is that there's, a, there's, a, there's what's called a shard region actor, and that's has the behavior of the proxy. It does other things, but it has the behavior of the proxy. There's a shard coordinator actor, which is the ultimate decision maker on where shards actually are distributed across the cluster. These are Akka actors, you know, things that we get from Akka. They're, they're actors, but we don't have to write the code for these. These already exist. So the, the idea is that there's a cluster singleton that is the shard coordinator. Again, it's, being that it's a cluster singleton, there's only one instance of that in, in the cluster, and it moves around if, if the node that the, the cluster singleton is currently on goes down. But there's these shard region actors. So what's, what's happening here is that, say we want to send a command to a specific entity, and that command could come in on any node in the cluster. You send a command message to any one of these shard region actors, the shard, any shard region actor can receive a command for a specific entity, and it will take care of routing that command message to the entity actor wherever it is in the cluster. So we don't have to write the code to do that. That's already done. Right? This, this is giving us the, the clustering ability. So what I'm trying to show here in this little diagram is the, you know, the, the decision makers are kind of the, the uh, shard region and the, uh, the shard coordinator those are actors that we don't have to write. The entity actor is something that we write, but it's really just focused on handling messages coming into an entity. We're, you know, and these entity actors are, are distributed across the cluster. So let's take a look at that code. Let's see, here's cluster sharding. So here I want to start with the main. So this is a, just a sample application, but it's pretty close to what you would do for real. Um, there's a main method, and it, it's set up where it could run with some default ports. So, so what I'm uh, doing here is that with, with Akka, there's this concept of some of the uh, nodes have to, are called seed nodes. And the idea is that, say, um, the seed nodes have to be started first, and they're on well-known ports. So when other nodes start up and want to join the cluster, they need to know how to, they need to, know how to call home. So every node is started up with 
um, is configured with the seed nodes. So other nodes join, they communicate with these well-known ports on whatever host the, the seed nodes are on and say, hey, I'd like to join the cluster. And Anaka takes care of you know, bringing that, uh, that new node into the cluster. So there's, you know, it's typically no, uh, use ports 2551, 2552, something like that. It, this is all configurable, but it's just kind of a, uh, of a default that people often use. The real interesting part, though, in this is that starting up an actor system on each port. So an actor system is a, like, kind of like an execution context you know, for threading, where um, the actors, we, we create an actor system, one line of code, and then with the actor system, then you can start creating instances of actors. So here's an example on line 44, actor system, actor of, and we're creating this actor called, uh, I haven't showed you this actor yet, but um, uh, cluster listener actor. And this props method is a form of, um, inst of doing a new with Akka. So what we have to do is when we create an instance of an actor, it's Akka you know, is actually doing it through this props method. Fairly easy to set up. I'm not going to bore you with the details on this. If you're interested, you can see it in the code. But the, the more interesting thing that's happening here is in, in this little setup cluster sharding method. So if we look at that setup cluster sharding down here on line 64, what we're doing is we're just calling a static method get on this cluster sharding class. And we're, we're just saying, you know, here's the actor system. Let's start up cluster sharding on this node. And there's really two key, there's four parameters here, but two of them are most important. One of them is we're passing the entity actor props method. And what that is, is that's the method that's used to create instances of the entity actor. The other one is this message extractor. And I want to show you the code for this. This message extractor is fairly easy to set up. There's three methods that you need to override. The two most important ones are shard ID and entity ID. The shard ID is the most important one. So what, what you do here is that what this is doing is it, it looks at incoming um, messages and you write the code. This is custom code that, that you and I have to write. Uh, but we write the code that comes up with the, the um, shard ID for a, a given message. So in this case, you know, these messages have an ID and then I'm just taking that ID and getting the hash code and dividing it by the number of shards, where I, I've set that up to be an arbitrary number of 100. There's documentation that talks about sharding strategies and so on in Naka. Um, won't go into detail on that right here, but just want to show you this is something that you implement, fairly straightforward code. And once we have this, we have an ability to tell Akka you know, what the shard ID is for uh, given messages. So back on the runner, we create the, um, the cluster sharding that, that comes back with an, an actor reference back here up on line 46, where we're, um, we're getting an actor reference. And then I'm creating two new actors, uh, two additional actors, this entity command actor and this entity query actor. And I'm passing in the, the shard region into the constructor. <coughs> so let's take a look at the, the entity command actor. So this entity command actor, what this is simulating is something that's generating commands. It could be like a web front end. You know, you're getting an H HTTP request. That request comes in, it's translated into sending a message to, an, to, to uh, Akka. You know, like, here's a deposit coming in from a web form that gets translated into uh, a message getting sent to an entity, OK? Um, so this, this actor is set up with um, I'm, ac I'm actually creating two mes messaging handling routines. One's, I, I, I came up with these names. One's called sending and one's called receiving. So this is, actors uh, can change their behavior or, and they call it changing their state. And when you change the behavior of an actor, what you're doing is you're changing how it handles incoming messages. So in this case, I'm, this actor flips from a sending state to a receiving state and back to a sending state and back to receiving state. So what, the reason I did this is that after, after it um, sends a command, say like a, a, a command to, for a particular entity, it's expecting, expecting to receive an acknowledgement back. So as, when it's in a sending state, it sends out a, a, a random command for a random entity ID, you know, just to simulate um, 
real activity, and then it's expecting back an acknowledgement. So, um, so here we have the, the tick again. You know, I'm just using this tick to, to kind of generate activity, you know, to simulate a, a load. And then when we do tick sending, which is down here on line 45, uh, I'm just doing a, uh, to the shard region, I'm just doing a tell. My local shard region, I'm doing a tell. This command method that I'm invoking here, what it does is it's generating um, a random command, right? And again, I won't bother you with the code here. You can look at it if you're interested. But the idea is I'm creating a command for some entity ID. And it's sending it to the shard region. When this happens, it goes to the shard region on its local node, and then that um, message is forwarded to the entity actor somewhere in the cluster. So that entity actor is created only when it starts receiving messages. If the entity actor isn't receiving messages, it's nowhere in memory. But if a message comes in for a specific entity actor, Akka will create that actor for you, and the actor comes to life. So the entity actor is this class right here. So it's just this relatively simple actor. Um, it's create receive again. How do I handle messages? So here I, I'm either getting command messages or query messages. Okay, when a command message comes in, I invoke this command method down here on line 26. And this is just code I set up um, where the idea is that the first time I receive a command message, the, uh, it's kind of the, the entity is in an uninitialized state. Uh, you know, because I, I don't have any knowledge of the entity is coming in from a command. So I just log out, you know, um, I, I receive the command, and I'm in, I've initialized myself, and then it just uh, sends back to the sender uh, a command acknowledgement. Okay? If it receives the, uh, say, a command and the actor had already existed for that entity, then it's, you know, I'm just sending, logging out, okay, I've updated myself, okay? And then send back an acknowledgement. So the command actor is, uh, again, sending off commands to an entity. The command actor doesn't have to know anything about where the entity is in the cluster. And that entity actor can move around the cluster depending on how many nodes are in the cluster and if we lose nodes or we add nodes. All the, the distribution of messages is being handled by Akka. So I'm, we're not having to write any kind of complicated uh, distribution, like where is the entity actor at? Does the entity actor exist or not? And all that stuff's being handled by Akka for us. We're just really kind of focusing on uh, writing the entity co the code itself. So that's pretty much it. it there's a, a method I got set up to handle incoming commands and a method I got set up to handle incoming queries. And we'll see a more interesting uh, example in the next project in just a moment. So the command actor is expecting to receive back, uh, let me go back up here, when it's receiving, it's expecting to receive back an acknowledgement. And when it receives an acknowledgement, it, uh, let me go to that method, wherever it is, here it is, line, four, uh, line 50, it, receives the acknowledgement, I just log it out, and this is an example on line 52 here where it's switching state back to sending. So it was in receiving state, and now it's gonna switch back to ascending state. This is really powerful, this kind of state change. You don't, it's, it's not used all the time, but when you need it, it can be really handy. Like for example, one system I worked on, um, we had the concept of kicking off batch jobs. And we had actors that represented the state of a batch job. So a batch job, say, when it wasn't running, was in idle state. So it went from idle to starting to running to stopping back to idle. So we, ch we could change the behavior of the messages that that, that actor, you know, how it would, re would react to messages would be different when it's idle versus uh, starting or running. For example, if we receive a message to start the job, when it's in an idle state, it starts it's, it goes through the process of starting the job. If it receives a message to start the job when it's in a starting state or a running state, it just ignores that message. It's, yeah, I heard you. I, you know, I'm, I'm running. You know, so it, it's a kind of a very powerful way to, um, to do things you know, in kind of in a stateful way. So that's it for cluster sharding. Let's, let me move on here real quick to 
the, the meat of what I wanted to talk to you about. So the, the event sourcing in Seacrest, the last two, uh, two projects of the five projects here. So <clears throat> let's go to so the cluster persistence project. So I'm going to go to the runner again. This is the, where the main's at to start up ACA, uh, the actor system on each node in the cluster. So I, line 42, we create the, and, and the actor system. Um, we do the shard region again. We, we set that up just like we did in, in the uh, prior project. And then all I'm doing after that is I'm just creating a uh, entity command actor and an entity query actor. So those are actors that, again, just simulate activity. But the, uh, the real interesting part here is setting up the shard region, which is down here on line 63, where, again, we're setting up cluster sharding. But this time, we're, set, we're creating, um, we're, we're tell, telling cluster sharding that the actor, the entity actor, is this thing called a entity persistence actor. So let's take a look at that guy. So this any persistence actor is a little different. It extends a base class of abstract persistence actor. And what it inherits is a little bit different. And also, the, there's another method that we have to implement. One is called create, receive, recover. This is new. We haven't seen this before. And then there's still create, receive. So the idea is that when a message is sent to a specific entity, and that actor for that entity doesn't yet exist in the cluster, it, that actor will be created. And the first thing that happens is that we go to the event store and we recover the entity state. So like if, we, if this is the example here I'm using is a bank balance or bank account. So we're going and we're retrieving all the, uh, the deposits and withdrawals that have been previously stored for this entity and replaying them into the actor so that the actor can recover the balance, right? And, and again, there's, uh, there's the, the possibility of a snapshot. So we don't have to go through all the history, like say this bank account's been around for 10 years. We don't want to uh, run through 10 years of history. We can go from the most recent snapshot um, forward, you know, any, any uh, events that have occurred after the snapshot has been done. I didn't do this in this implementation, but it's, it's simple to set up and it's pretty well documented. So, Essentially, the actor goes into a recovery mode first, and then it switches to a normal running mode. So here, when it's in this recovery mode, it's just receiving messages again. Again, the only way to talk to an actor is to send it messages. So we're getting back the deposit events or the withdrawal events from the event store. This is just being handled for us, and they're being sent to us, uh, to the actor, as messages. And all we're doing is we're, I'm just kind of updating the balance, you know, the account balance. In this case, this could be much more elaborate depending on uh, what you're you know, actually implementing. So either there's a deposit recover or there's a withdrawal recover. And then once that happens, then we can just start receiving commands. So now we have a deposit command, for example, that comes in. And when it happens, we're going to invoke a deposit method. So the deposit method is the main thing that it's doing is, is, is calling this persist method. This is a method we inherit from the base class. And that's where the magic happens. The persist actually uh, causes the event to be stored in the event store. And then there's a, there's a callback method that you pass to it. So the, it persists it in the persist store. Once it's persisted, it, it uh, invokes this callback method, which is, in this case, I have a handle deposit. So the handle deposit gets the, met, uh, the, uh, the event back. It looks at it to say, is the payload of this event um, a deposit event? If it is, then um, it's, what it's going to do is it's going to update the state of the entity, like it's a deposit, so it's going to add to the, you know, to the account. And then it's just going to uh, send an acknowledgment back to the sender. Now, th the fact that I'm acknowledging here is just something I did. It, it's not something that you have to do. This is all kind of up to you what messages you, you receive and what messages that you send back. And that's pretty much it. The same thing with withdrawal. Withdrawal gets persisted. Um, and when it's persisted, 
Um, there's the, the, um, the, the callback method that is invoked, and we update the state. Now, one thing I'm doing here that uh, I really didn't talk about yet is in the persist, I'm taking a command and turning it into an event. So that's what's happening in this tag command method. Um, and the reason I'm, it, as I'm calling it tagged is that the, the reason for tagging an event is a form of metadata that's used in the, um, the, the query side, the read side. So the idea is that we kind of partition the events so that we can retrieve events by partition. And the, the partition is a tag. So it's kind of like with uh, Kafka. You know, Kafka, you have topics that, that you, you break apart and you, you consume from, um, I, I forget the term for it, you know, the partition or whatever in the topic that, you, you know, so you have multiple consumers for the same topic so you can kind of distribute the load, not have one consumer for all the, the uh, mes messages coming into a topic you can have multiple consumers. So the, the idea is the same here, that we can have, uh, we can kind of uh, have multiple consumers of events so that we can distribute the load. So that's, that's what I'll be showing you in the, in the next project. So here I want to run this. So in this example, hopefully everything will work. Um, the, I'm in the directory for this, where this project is set up, and I've got a, just some aliases that I've set up real quick so I can do this real quick. All I'm doing is invoking a Maven command to execute the, the run, run time and, and pass it uh, port numbers. So this first one uh, that I want to send to is it's starting up on port 2552. And in the second window, I'm going to start up another uh, node and it's going to be on two, uh, sorry, the first one's 2501, the second one's 2552. The third one I'm going to start on a, a random port. And then the, uh, this fourth one I'm going to save for the, the query side. So right now, what, what I've done is I started up th a three-node cluster. Three different JVMs all running on my laptop, but they could have just as been easily, easily be three Docker containers running, you know, say, in Kubernetes. <coughs> okay. Um, so let me show you. I've got the logs here. So we, if everything's working right, this, this thing started up. And um, I want to show you a little bit. This, this one actor, I haven't showed you the code for it, but um, this cluster listener actor, all it's doing is kind of listening to cluster of events. And I'm logging them out. So the reason I'm doing this is that I'm showing, uh, from the perspective of, perspective of this node, is seeing other nodes starting up. So you can see. Uh, member one is coming up, member two, member three. So the idea is that, um, let's see, we got, we should have three nodes here. Yeah, see, like this one is in the joining state right here. Um, so just kind of logging out as the cluster is coming to life and things are getting started, you know, eventually the cluster settles down into the three nodes that are running. But the fun part, let me just go to the bottom of the log here, is that it's running along, and it's just uh, the, those command and query actors are generating um, messages and firing off to entities. And entities are getting created across the cluster. So the, 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 where, I, where a particular entity is going to get created is pretty de determined by the, the shard ID. And that shard ID is kind of random, right? We're just using the hash code and dividing by the number of shards. So you can see, let me just see if I can grab one here. Okay, here's a word, um, an acknowledgement to a uh, withdrawal, right? And the withdrawal was for entity ID 62. I'm, I'm doing like random, randomly generating a, a entities from 1 to 100 in this little test project. Um, so let me, let's see if we can get a, something more interesting. So here's uh, where we're recovering. An actor is coming to life for a particular entity. In this case, is, it's entity ID 7. And it's recovering previously um, created uh, events for that entity. So the, 
You can see this one's for ID 58. This one's a little bit more interesting. See, it recovered a, um, let's see, it's a, uh, where's that? A deposit, uh, the, yeah, a with, withdrawal, and then a, another withdrawal was like three withdrawals. All right, and then it's doing the, a deposit against that, um, that entity. So the idea is it that those command actors are kind of randomly sending off command messages to different entities. Those entity actors are getting created when they're needed, and, then they, and when they don't receive any messages after a certain period of time, they'll shut themselves down. Okay, and everything's getting written in, in this case, I'm running Cassandra. So we're capturing the, the events in a, a, a Cassandra table. So I'm going to leave this running, these three guys running right now, and I want to show you um, the, the final project, which is the, the read side, which is also called Aka Persistence Query. So in this case, I'm going to go to the runner real quick. The runner is just creating, it's not doing, I'm not doing sharding for this, I could, but I, I wanted to keep this, this simple. Um, it's creating an actor called uh, pull general events actor. So let's take a look at that guy. So this, what this actor does is it's creating child actors. You know, actors can create other actors and they have this relationship as kind of a parent child or, or supervisor worker type of relationship. So this actor down in the pre-start method, starting on line 20 here, it just goes into a loop for the number of tags and it's creating an actor per tag, okay, which is this pull tag journal events actor. So let's jump into that guy real quick. So this actor is set up, notice that on line 36 on the receive builder, it's not set up to receive any messages and that's not what this actor does. What this actor does is in the pre-start, it sets up um, Connecting to, connecting to Cassandra, and then it invokes this method called run pull uh, journal stream. So this run pull journal stream, what th this is doing is it's using Akka streams to retrieve events that uh, have occurred since the last time this guy ran, and it will just sit there running and pull events as they occur once it catches up. Okay, so say right now. We're creating entities. This, those, those three nodes I started a few minutes ago are still running. But this one isn't running yet. So it's, it's falling behind, right? But it's, it knows where it left off because what I'm doing in this uh, actor as well is I'm saving an offset. Just like, you know, how many of you guys have used Kafka? Anybody? So, okay. So with Kafka, it's kind of, the idea is that it's, it's a form of publish subscribe, but the subscriber actively pulls. It's not being pushed to the subscriber, the subscriber is pulling. And what it's doing is pulling based on offset. So the subscriber has an offset, you know, like there's a, a log that the publisher is creating of, of events. And the subscriber knows where it left off. So say maybe the subscriber's way ahead, or the publisher's way ahead, but the subscriber's fallen behind. So when the su subscriber starts up, it goes to the last offset that it successfully had uh, uh, pulled and it starts working forward until it catches up. And once it catches up, then it just kind of keeps up. As a, sub as a publisher creates new stuff, the subscribers now, they're kind of in sync. But the subscriber could fall behind, say the publisher can run faster than the subscriber, so the publisher can r race ahead of it and the subscriber will eventually catch up. So it's, it, there's this pull approach versus the, the, the push approach. This is what this guy is doing in this stream that's getting set up here um, with this source. The, um, this, the, this is Akka stream, so it's a stream, right? And all we're doing is that we run the stream, run for each, and then we just invoke this handle method. And this handle method, basically, a handle event, where, there it is, down on line 67, um, it's, all it's <clears throat> doing is it's, pulling that event and then it's saving the offset. So I'm saving the offset every time, you know, so that if this guy fails, it knows where it, knows where it left off and it can pick up from there. So let me do this. I'm just gonna, cause I'm running out of time. In this 
final window, I'm going to start up. Uh, I'm already in the persistence query project. I'm going to start up an another Akka node. This, this node is going to come up, and it's going to run this actor, one for each tag. There's 10 tags in this case. So there's 10 of these guys that are going to be pulling events as they're being created. So hopefully everything's running OK. Let's take a look at the log. So this guy started up. Let me go to the end of the log. Ah, I don't know what's causing. I just saw this before. <laughs> the demo gods are not with me on this one. I'm getting this error. Um, let me go back up. What you should be seeing is the um, the events getting pulled as they're happening. Something's wrong with this, where I'm getting this error. I apologize. I just saw it before I started. I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. So what should be happening here is that um, you should be seeing that as events are, or as events are being uh, stored by the, the other three nodes, this guy is picking it up. Some, something's wrong. I apologize uh, in, in this code here. Um, oh, here's, here, okay, here's an example. You can see the, these events. You can see a deposit event. Um, it goes through these periods of insanity and sanity, it looks like. Um, so here's a period of sanity where it's, it's picking up events as they're occurring and, uh, and propagating them. So, oops, sorry, I went too far. These are the five projects. They're, I tried to keep these projects as simple as possible, really focused on the mechanics. Like I said, the first three projects are kind of ex uh, the example projects that set up doing things like a, a simple actors talking to each other in the first project. The second one is doing a little bit of cluster singleton. The third one is doing basic cluster sharding. The fourth one is actually doing, um, you know, writing to a Cassandra event store. And the fifth project, which I got to fix something in there, is the one that's supposed to be handling the, uh, the, the subscriber to the events. And then I'm not, uh, I'm only picking up the events. I'm not pushing them into a real database because, you know, like I said, you could be uh, storing the events as in a relational database or an elastic search or whatever you want to do. But the, the point I wanted to show here was the code that it's required for uh, keeping up with the events as they occurred on the, on the right side and persisting them in the, the read side. So simple projects, you can run them in like multiple command windows and off you go. So that's what I had. Thank you very much for your time.